Hi and welcome back to Matrix Moments. This is Saloni and I'm here today with Avnish Bajaj, Founder Managing Director of Matrix Partners India. Today's episode is about making sense of valuations and whether it's a quixotic pursuit or not. So how are startups really valued in venture capital, Avnish? Can you break this down for us? Hi Saloni, happy to be back for another Matrix Moment. Uh, another topic that's very near and dear to my heart and I'm going to warn the listeners that this is going to be a bit of a combination of uh, some theory, uh, some practice and I guess some views uh, around it. But let's start by, let me ask you, why do people invest? Why do you invest? To make money. Okay, so what does money mean? Are you looking for well, let me answer that. I mean, money is of different forms. People look at capital gains, uh, appreciation in price would be one mm-hmm. form of money. The other would be actual earnings, right? Actually making, getting, getting cash flows and, and income out of, out of the investment. So the reality is as you are thinking about it, and let's chat a bit more on this. How do you see investing in a bank fixed deposit different from investing in, let's say, in an early stage company? Higher returns. Very good. That's one way of thinking about it. It's also higher risk. So higher returns are coming because of higher risk, but that's exactly the point. So the reality is, one, before we go to valuations, we should talk about why do valuations matter? And the reality is that valuations come in only if you're investing. And what is the value at which you are investing? So we say, okay, why do people invest? Because they want returns, like you said. Right. Returns vary ac- across asset classes. There are notionally less, not notionally, but actually probably in reality also less risky asset classes. You said bank FDs, they are less risky. The ultimate so-called quote-unquote riskless asset class, maybe cash, uh, who knows, but cash can actually you know, go, uh, go down if inflation. So a lot of technical theory comes mm-hmm. in. Now, gold, one can talk about. So the reality is the riskless asset class that people generally benchmark to are the bonds issued by the government. Mm-hmm. And, and in the US, you will hear a lot about US treasury bond yields. In India, what the RBI rates are, mm-hmm. how it affects. So those are typically what the riskless ones are valuations really start coming in and those are those asset classes are really tied into macroeconomics and how a country is doing and stuff like that you know countries like argentina have defaulted venezuela are defaulted there or zimbabwe has crazy inflation i don't even know whether they bought and trade mm-hmm. but they may be giving you 100% returns but the risk is so much higher right so valuations really start coming in in the context of the risk you are taking and Irrespective of what people say, the reality is there is one theory on which everything is valued, but nobody talks about it as much. It's called something called, and this is where we have to get a little bit pedantic, it's called Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPM. And underlying that, people can Google it, they can look up the formula, maybe we can even post the formula. But underlying that is to say, There is a risk-free return that you can get by investing in something very, very secure, like a government's issuance of bonds. And then as you start taking more risk, depending on the risk of the asset class, you want more premium to that return. So if you invest in government of India bonds, I don't know the rates, but let's say it's six, six and a half percent. If you're investing in a bank FD, your rate has risk has gone up, you want eight and a half percent. If you're investing in, let's say an early stage company, maybe you want 50 percent. If you invest in the stock market, maybe you want 15 to 20%. This is actually the theory. And this the underlying theory of that is that essentially you are looking to generate some kind of return. The return ultimately has to be cash flows. And therefore, there is a model called discounted cash flows. And that's really the present value of that is what the value of the asset is. The risk you are taking determines how much you discount it back, the IRR. Now, all of this sounds very pedantic. It is, but that is the theory. And that is the right theory. So it is essentially capital asset pricing model, which determines, bases the riskiness of the asset, what return you should be getting. And then depending on the asset, technically speaking, even the companies we invest in, 
we should be projecting out their cash flows in the future and discounting them back at that return. That's the price of that asset. That's the theory. Okay. It's just not possible to use it. Because if I'm investing in and very early and we'll come to some of that. So this is the first principles of how things are valued. Then because this has a tendency to become gigo, garbage in, garbage out. Because everything is an assumption. I don't know how to measure the risk of the asset. I don't know how to measure the future cash flows. I don't know so many things that it ends up becoming an Excel spreadsheet, which will potentially churn out garbage depending on the inputs. Now, in certain businesses, it can be done. Mm -hmm. So what happens is people start moving. The best investors understand this theory and then they start moving away from this theory to second principles after understanding it and saying what are the best proxies for it. Right. right. So let's go to public market stocks. What is the first proxy people pick price to earnings ratio? Okay. Right. Now, interestingly, if people a lot of people don't sometimes think think they have thought about it this way, but price to earnings, if you reverse it, is earnings divided by price. That is like the interest rate you are getting. So if a stock has a price to earnings of 20, the interest rate I'm getting is 5% because it's one by 20. If I'm getting 8% in the market, should I be investing in that? That's where things start becoming complicated because the market then says, what is the growth of this and stuff and like that. Another very simple thumb rule that people use is in real estate and which by the way, nobody clearly uses in Bombay because, because no real estate would sell here. Uh, the simple thing is if I am buying a real estate asset and I rent it out, what is my yield on that, on the amount I've put in? How much is the rent divided by the price I've paid? In Mumbai, city of Mumbai and residential real estate between two to 3%. How much is the interest rate on the loan I'm paying for it? Nine to 10%. Should I be buying? No. But yet people buy. It's an emotional decision. But it's not, it does not make sense on first principles. Commercial real estate in Mumbai, 65 to 7% yield makes a little bit more sense because you can get even actually loans and there are deductions that you can. So these are how people come up with proxies to value assets because this first principle is not work, the, is not possible to always put down on a spreadsheet. But that doesn't mean that the first principle itself is not correct. People also say, hey, this company, so in the stock market, people, or even in our business, people say, this company sold at so and so multiple. So they use that as a proxy. So the next company will also sell at that multiple. Well, not really. You know, what were the fundamentals? People, people just sometimes don't think that through. Um, so, so like I said, what is the takeaway? The takeaway is there are Risky assets. So before we talk about valuation, valuations are in the context of investing. Investing is in the context of risk and return. And the risk and return is essentially the, the theoretical model of that is a, is a model that talks about how, how one should model risk and how one should model return, mm -hmm. which is around discounted cash flows. But because those are very hard to model, although in some businesses people do, which are generally mature businesses, uh, people tend to use proxies for it. Mm. Okay, so that tells us what forms the basis of valuations in terms of first principles that people go by. But if we had to go slightly deeper, this would vary as per the sector or the industry of the business that one is valuing. What are some of the thumb rules or principles to be conscious of as an investor? And are there any that are specific to an industry? So what is the challenge in the VC space? The challenge in the VC space is number one, companies are often not making money. Number two, they are sometimes growing very, very fast. I mean, imagine if you had to price Facebook using this model or Google using this model in, you know, when they were just starting out. Today, they are seven, eight hundred, nine hundred billion dollar companies. Apple maybe had some cash flows. Uh, third, they are often illiquid. You can't even, you know, trade them. So it becomes very, very hard to figure out how does one value these businesses. So. We said we deviate from first principles into thumb rules. So people deviate from first principles even more. So for example, in e-commerce, people use price to gross merchandise value right. as a proxy. In enterprise businesses, people use price to revenue as a proxy. In financial services, people use price to book as a proxy. Uh, so on and so forth. In capex heavy businesses, people use price to EBITDA as a proxy. Now yeah. here's what happens and where the mistake happens. 
people think that these are new valuation techniques they are actually not new valuation techniques they are proxies for an underlying first principles valuation technique because you don't have all the data to be able to apply that first principles valuation technique because a business is not profitable i am not able to do a price to earnings multiple because the business's cash flows are uncertain i am not able to do dcf but all of this we backed into from that same underlying first principle which was the capital asset asset pricing mod model so it's a little bit the tail wagging the dog situation where the proxy becomes the rule right right and the proxy becomes the original approach but that's where uh, all the mistakes happen so let's take a couple of quick examples for people because these are proxies we we moved already from present value of discounted cash flows to saying let's use pe's mm -hmm. as a multiple then the second thing i told you was pe's are in the context of growth so mm -hmm. another thumb rule people have is peg multiple of 1 if a stock is growing at 30% if mm -hmm. a company is growing at 30% the pe should be 30 okay now if i am valuing a company that doesn't have e yeah. i can't give a pe so now 30 times 30 the market cap of the company because peg is one price earnings to growth is one 30 times 30 is 900 of a company that is making 100 rupees of revenue 100 mm -hmm. that's a nine times sales multiple so therefore people say okay if i believe this margin structure in the end state of this company because i don't know the current earnings i will value it at nine times sales right the problem then become often happens people start using nine times sales without thinking what the margin structure is without thinking what the growth rate is right so again the proxy starts becoming the rule the tail starts wagging the dog that becomes the 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 actual way of uh, valuing things another example i'll give you very quickly i said high capex businesses are valued on ebitda because why they have earnings but depending ebitda as a concept takes out the how much debt and how much equity you have in the business and because it's a capex heavy business it likely has a lot of debt so people want to look at the operating earnings of their business which is ebitda now let's say people say business growing 20% 15 times multiple now what is that on price to sale 15 times 20 is 300 that's a 3 times price to sales multiple so like i said there are these are all proxies to the same underlying methodology one should look at a little bit of uh, first of all recognize that these are proxies and then look at a bunch of data yeah. to actually zero in on which proxy is right to use in a particular uh, setting now one caveat I'll actually let's come to price to gmv the most abused one in e-commerce you know i have heard and i have seen companies valued at 6 8 10 times gmv gmv mm. is not revenue revenue is but, GMV times take rate. Take rate is typically the commission hmm. that the site is taking. It can be ten percent. It can be twenty percent. Now those are two very different numbers. So if I believe we discussed earlier, businesses can be valued at nine times sales or nine times revenue. So what does that mean in terms of GMV? If the revenue is fifteen to twenty percent of the GMV, that means that business should be valued at one point five to maybe two times approximate numbers of GMV. Mm -hmm. Yet people talk about eight ten times. Right. Again, why? because the proxy becomes the end state mm. one is not thinking through a business with a take rate of 10% should be valued at half the business of a take rate of 20% this it gets more complicated than that but that is really the way to think about it right so what you're saying is that which proxy to apply in which setting is uh, obviously key in helping you determine or at least brings you closer to determining the accurate value of the company But coming back to my first question, how does one truly make sense of valuations? I thought that's what I've been doing. Clearly, I've not been answering answering the question well. So, look, I understand. So, I I think you know the the objective so far was to build some theory behind the practice. I think we we've, we've talked about some of that. I want to make one or two caveats before we try to actually hit the questions. Sure. So we talked about various multiples. now the multiples are all in the context of a particular company and a particular quality of business mm -hmm. so the margins of the business really matter yeah. and people should be thinking about these multiples in that context uh, there is this concept of pre money multiples versus post money multiples often investors take whatever is convenient because if i am doing a multiple on 
earnings and I show post money, by definition, that's going to look bigger. So people go to their investment committees with pre-money. But the reality is the next investor who's coming in, that post money multiple has become a pre-money for them. So lots of gamification happens, unfortunately, in our in our uh, industry. The biggest one is in fintech, uh, where the only place where the price to uh, the multiple looks lower on post money basis is in is in fintech. So wherever it looks lower is where investors pick it. Wherever wh whereas what they should be doing is wherever it looks higher is what they should be doing because that's what they are really playing mm. paying. So. In fintech, people do this Ponzi scheme of post money, price to money book and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's a topic for another day. But I think the context of how we use these multiples is, is very important. Now, I had mentioned earlier that valuations and coming back to finally trying to answer the question. Um, valuations are, first of all, like I said, in a context. Second, valuation is actually not Kiko. The people know, the people who are... Some of the best investors in the world are very valuation sensitive, sensitive very right. price sensitive. And price and value are, very, as Warren Buffett says it very well, they are not the same thing. Yeah. First, figure out what the value is. Price is what is trading between people. If, and then try to get as close as possible to the value or below the value. Mm -hmm. Now, in our business, sometimes that doesn't always work, right? Multiples are driven by sentiment. Value is the fundamental. So that is the core of... Uh, how, how one should be doing this. Now, I think the difference of how this works really in, in our business or in general is that the best investors spend time thinking about value versus price. You go to a meeting with an with a entrepreneur, often people will say, what do you want? Yeah. Or what, what is your price expectation? What is your expectation? What is your valuation expectation? Valuation expectation is not the value. And what happens is that people start confusing price and value, like I said earlier. So how should we be using it? We should be using it by recognizing that the value of a business is very different from the price of that business. And ultimately, that business is going to converge. The price will converge to the value. Now, when you are at very early stages uh, of a business, it is for us to figure out how do we think future backwards? Mm. How do we think at, at exit, most likely the price and value will converge? So for the sake of argument, let's take the e-commerce business example. If I have paid six to eight times GMV, believing that it's a multiple of sales, right? right? And that's what the market is doing and that's what every, everybody is doing. Five, seven, eight years down the road when that business is mature, it's going to be valued, let's say one and a half times GMV. That business has to grow many fold more because my multiple is about to contract by call it 60%, 70%, 80% depending on, on, on what I paid. I think that context keeping in mind is important in our business. So there, there I would say VCs do think about, ab about that. Um, I would also say that it varies by stage. If I am at a very early stage, very early stage investor, uh, or let's step back, I would say think of it as three rules. One, it varies by stage. If I'm at seed or series A, I think about ownership, how much capital I'm giving the business, how much runway will it have. If I'm at series B, I start thinking a little bit more about how this business will scale and what will happen. If I'm mm -hmm. at later stages, I'm really thinking exit backwards. Mm -hmm. So the second rule, first rule varies by stage. Second rule, think exit backwards. When this business is ultimately sold, what multiples happen in the market? Go through the history of the markets, look at through cycle multiples and then go to what that value will be and come backwards. Given where we play, we generally can't project so far out in the future. So we typically say with our capital, how far will this business go? What in that stage, in a base case, not in a delusional case, will it be worth? And then try to back into what we think the current value is. Okay. And what would your third rule be? Ha. <laughs> The reason I didn't say it, uh, so the third rule is that real money is made when these rules are broken. So, so the reality is, the problem is that the exception starts becoming the rule, right. right? So ultimately one has to break some of the rules. And somebody I really respect in this business said it really well, which is first understand the rules and then break them. I think what I observe is that 
often and by the way typically there will be five six seven rules or fundamentals of first principles you break one one of them or two of them not all of them so i think the best investors in the world a understand the rules yeah b understand which rule they are breaking mm -hmm. and c do it only a few times in their lifetime mm -hmm. not in a few times in a year and warren buffett is a great example i mean he is the ultimate understands every rule of investing when the financial crisis happened he had been tracking goldman sachs for i don't know how many years and he put in 5 billion dollars over a 24 hour period he broke a rule who does without any diligence 5 billion dollars but he wow. he had been you know tracking the company for a while but they don't do it every day and then they don't start believing that they are so good they they realize that they have broken a rule and and they have done that as opposed to believing that breaking the rules is the rule i think right. that's the bottom line got it thanks avnish thank you for listening and you can find the transcribed version of this podcast on matrixpartners.in you can also follow us on twitter and linkedin for more updates